Greetings. I'm Monica evans Lome, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the International Nurses Society on Addiction new webinar series that focuses on the use of opiate treat or therapies for treatment of opiate dependence and on the safe use of opiate treatment of chronic pain. This series is one of many resources made available by the Prescribers Clinical Support System Opiate Therapy, a program that is funded by the Federal Center for Substance Abuse Treatment and operated collaboratively by six other partner organizations, the American, of, American Academy of Addiction Psychiatry, the American Psych, ah, Psychi Psychiatric Association, pardon me, the American Medical Association, and the American, um, sorry, the American Osteopathic Academy of Addiction Medicine, and the American Dental Association, and the American Society for Pain Management Nursing. We want to thank you all for joining us here today. A few quick housekeeping notes before we begin today's presentation. In the upper right-hand side of your computer seat, screen, you'll see a control panel. Um, in the lower portion of that panel, participants can type a question or comment um, to submit to the webinar organizers. You can do this at any time during the presentation. Uh, we will reserve about 10 minutes at the end of the presentation for question and answers. So at any time, if you have a question, just submit it there, and then we will go through those all at the end of the presentation. If you're unable to get all of the if we're unable to address all the questions in the allotted time, Dr. Rendio has agreed to respond to them in writing. So um, at the conclusion of the webinar, we will have the recorded webinar, the presentation handout slides, and the question and answer portion will be posted all on the um, INSA webinar, um, website for your use. So you can download those and um, share those or, or look at those um, for, um, uh, for use in the future. So today, Dr. Al Rundio will address pharmacological therapies um, for substance use disorders. He will address the following objectives. Number one, to discuss um, pharmacologic therapies for detoxification for substance use disorders. And number two, discuss the pharmacologic therapies for relapse prevention for substance use disorders. Dr. Rundio is the president-elect of INSA. He developed and teaches the CARN and the CARN AP review course for INSA. Dr. Rendio is the Assistant Dean for Advanced Practice nurse Nursing at Drexel University, College of Nursing and Health Professions. He is also the Chair of the Doctor of Nursing Practice Program there and is a Clinical Professor of Nursing. He also practices in a chemical dependency, chemical dependency residential, residential treatment center in southern New Jersey. Dr. Rendio is a consultant to the American Nurses Credentialing Center. He is one of the developers and presenters for the Mortal and Pestle pharmac Pharmacology Program for APN, sorry, APN. And he is one of the developers and presenters for the Nurse Executive Certification Review Course and also the Adult Health Nurse Practitioner Certification Review Course. So welcome, Dr. Rendio. Okay, hello everyone. It's great to be here. I always start my presentations with my uh, two best friends right now, and they are um, two dogs. And in a live audience, I always ask you to try to identify the type of dog, but you may not be able to do so because we're live, but I can't see you. So this is a papillon, and papillon is French for the word butterfly. Uh, this is Logan, and if you turned his head around, if you look at how their ears stand up and the coloring of the papillons, which they have a very distinct coloring, especially in their face, uh, the back of his head looks like a monarch butterfly. Now, I've had dogs before, but I never realized that there was such a thing as an alpha dog or an alpha male, and Logan, Logan is pure alpha. Um, everyone tells me that he actually is my boss, and that probably is very true. And then I always um, introduce you to um, what we call Luke. Luke is his name, and we call him the Million Dollar Dog, and I'll tell you why. 
my wife has coined a term for him. He can make the ugliest face when he's mad at you, as adorable as he is. And she calls him a pookie face, and his nickname is Pooks. And uh, actually, because he's a French dog, she calls him Mungu Pooks. But Pooks has pica, which means he likes to ingest inanimate objects. And in his first year of life, within about a three to four month time span, Luke ingested three times and had major surgery at the vet hospital at the University of Pennsylvania, which is a very good friend of my wife and myself because he saved Luke's life three times. And he's the million dollar dog because he was an uninsured American at that time. Luke's first year of life cost us around $20,000. So anyone who says I'm not a dog lover would be sadly mistaken. He's doing very well today. Um, he is insured and as you can see he is in a pen that's in our dining room because he gets into things and we've got to prevent that. But then he started ingesting the carpet. So Dad here came up with a new thing. You can see the piece of linoleum from Home Depot is the perfect size for his running pen. And that is Luke now around 10 pounds today. And uh, Luke is a very, very spoiled dog besides being the million dollar dog. So with that, you saw the learning objectives. I'm here to share a little bit of my knowledge with you from uh, what I've learned uh, practicing in the addictions field for at least 15 years. Um, and first I want to share my belief about addiction. My medical director, Dr. Uh, Michael DeShields, uh, really has taught me um, a lot about the humanistic side of addiction. And we consider it to be a biopsychosocial spiritual disease model. Um, he taught me that addictions is a chronic disease and he will educate, for example, emergency room physicians if we have to send a patient out and they quickly are sent back before they've been properly assessed or screened. Because unfortunately addictions still has some stigma in our society. And his uh, caveat is if a diabetic, you know, overate and rose their blood sugar to heights where they had to be hospitalized, we don't shun that person. Addictions being a chronic illness, if one relapse, why are we shunning that person? We want to get them to pick their feet back up, get them back into treatment so that they can engage in a meaningful recovery. So if we think of it as a chronic disorder, which it is, a lifelong disorder, yes, sometimes people relapse, although that's our goal to prevent that. And the good news is today there's wonderful pharmacology out there that can help us with the process. So my belief is that it is those four components, but as you know, we know it's a brain disease, and I'm sure you gathered that from Dr. Lorman's um, webinar a couple weeks ago if you were on that. And we believe that relapse prevention is a critical concept to understand, explore, and embrace, and we do a lot with pharmacology today to help us with that process. So just to refresh your memory about the human brain, uh, we're looking at this. The area that addiction uh, really affects is the primitive hindbrain. Um, on your screen, you will see that in an orange color where it's the reward system. And then, of course, that's where a lot of receptors are for medications to have their effect. But then, of course, it has to go up to our prefrontal cortex, and you see the area of purple there as judgment, where we have to experience the event as something that's pleasurable. So again, we call this entire area um, the uh, ventral tegmental area. It includes a few areas, which is the nucleus accumbens, the amygdala, and of course the prefrontal cortex. And that tends to be the primary mechanism in the brain where um, addictions has its roots. Again, I've listed the four areas for you, spelling them out. The ventral tegmental area, what we call the VTA, the nucleus accumbens, the amygdala, and the prefrontal cortex. Now this is kind of a fun thing to do, and I do a lot more with this in live presentations, because oftentimes they have more time, and it's fun with a live audience, but hopefully you'll be able to see it on the screen. And of course the neuron, which is in our brain and our spinal cord, are uh, cells that are very much different than any other cell in the body. 
and they basically communicate by sending signals to each other at specialized connections. So what is the connection between the two neurons called? And that is a synapse. And if you look at the um, terminals of the one neuron to the picture of the left and then the receiving dendrites in the other neuron, and I'm looking at the small picture in the top left corner, that's where the synapse occurs. Another way to look at it, if you look at the larger picture, you have the nerve impulse which sends the signal down the um, sending neuron. And then, of course, if you look at the blue, the light blue shaded area, you see the dendrite of the receiving neuron. That nerve impulse that's in pink, the sending neuron, is packed with neurotransmitters, vesicles with neurotransmitters. And then, of course, there are receptor sites on the dendrite of the receiving neuron that those neurotransmitters are going to attach to. So we're going to show you what it looks like. You have the terminals of the sending neuron. They have vesicles that are packed with neurotransmitters. And again, that is the pink neuron that you see in the picture to the left. And you just saw it kind of blink with a black circle around one of the vesicles that are packed with neurotransmitters. And you now see in red the little neurotransmitters. Again, I'm looking at that picture to your left. And then, of course, those neurotransmitters are released when the sending neuron fires, much like that. And then you saw the, neuron, the neurotransmitters come out. And, of course, now they're going to bind to the dendrite of the receiving neuron. So the neurotransmitters send the signal by binding to specific receptors on dendrites of the receiving neuron. So how does addictions result then? You know, let's talk about that for a second. What causes one to continually use a substance where one doesn't? You know, it's something to consider. And some of the theories are that there aren't enough circulating neurons neurotransmitters to begin with. I mean, dopamine is known as the pleasure neurotransmitter, and maybe people who have an addiction problem don't have enough circulating dopamine, so they're going to replace that by use of a certain substance. And don't forget, there also can be process addictions, things like gambling, or sex being an addiction. We're focusing more on substance use disorders, the chemicals, the chemicals of addiction. Um, other theories are that from prolonged drug use, you damage those neurons, which depletes the number of neurotransmitters where they can't transmit as effectively. So there are all sorts of, of theories out there, and thank goodness for things like functional magnetic resonance imaging and things like positive emission tomography, PET scanning, we're actually able to track and see the neurochemical releases that occur in brains of those who are addicted and those who are not. And as one psychologist at the University of Pennsylvania turns it, we have a stop and go mechanism in our brain. And with the addictive brain, of course, there's the go mechanism that allows us to use, but then people who have an addiction problems for some reason can't kick in that stop mechanism. And again, here you see the neurons kind of being released and binding to the dendrite of that receiving neuron. So again, the uh, neuron cells and the transmission of the neurotransmitters that occurs through a synapse is critical to this process. And then we basically have receptor sites for just about every substance of abuse. You know, again, through the advanced technology that we have today, um, we are able to identify this. There have been studies done with PET scanning where they put people into the PET scanner, and let's say it's a recovering cocaine addict, and they'll show one-second flashcards, and they'll show them a flashcard of a chair, and there's no neurochemical release. And then they show a flashcard one-second of a crack pipe, and there's this huge neurochemical release. Um, so again, there is something different in a person who has an addiction problem in their brain that's different than those who do not. And dopamine is one of the primary uh, neurotransmitters responsible for pleasure. Now I want to point out in this picture 
here you're seeing opioid receptors. You know, we know there are opiate receptors in our brain. Um, we know there are alcohol receptors. Um, certainly endorphins you can see hitting there. But I want you to focus towards the top of the picture on the um, item that looks like, and if you can see my mouse here, I'm kind of pointing it out, this ladle kind of looks like a soup ladle. It's half purple and part blue. The cup part is blue. I'm a big believer in the body maintaining homeostasis. And I always use my mom as an example. My mom was a smoker for most of her life because when she started smoking, we didn't know the dangers of smoking. And at age 67, she had colon cancer and needed a bowel resection. And I had her in the hospital. And she smoked about a pack of cigarettes every day. Her choice was Salem. I still remember the green Salem uh, packs of cigarettes. And she came in, and the medical physician on her case had ordered um, ABGs, pre-op. And her PO2 was something like 57. You know, normal PO2, your O2 saturation, is, should be 80 to 100. And the uh, physician, when he saw her, said to her, Phyllis, her name was Phyllis, you qualify for um, oxygen for home care on the Medicare program. So basically, he was telling her, you know, your PO2 is low, yet all the other aspects of her blood gas were normal. Her CO2 level wasn't raised. Basically, the body for 47 years had compensated for her. I did get her to quit on that admission, and seeing that PO2 level, I think, helped. The point is, when we have neurotransmitters that are put out to saturate certain cell receptors, sometimes too much can be put out, so then the body's going to take some back to that sending neuron. And that's through what we call the reuptake pump, where that uptake pump that you see as a soup ladle. Kind of the dopamine's been put out by the neurotransmitter, but there's so much circulating now. Let's normalize it, create homeostasis by pulling some of that back to that sending neuron. A great example is the class of medication that we use in psychiatry for depression called the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Think of the mechanism. Serotonin, one of the primary neurotransmitters to keep one not depressed, well, one of the theories is maybe too much of the SSRIs, um, not the SSRIs, but the serotonin is taken back to that cell, and it depletes the serotonin, so that's why one's depressed. So the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, reuptake inhibitors, we inhibit the reuptake of serotonin back to that sending neuron so that there's more serotonin circulating. So the pathway to addiction really is the reward pathway, and it really goes back to the primitive hind brain and our natural rewards with things like food, water, uh, sex, nurturing. And addiction is a state in which an organism engages in a compulsive behavior. They find that behavior rewarding, pleasurable, and then of course what can happen is loss of control and limiting intake. And this is my slide on what I call the cycle of addiction. If you start at the left circle, that's shaded a pink color, it's the experimentation phase. It's where people become preoccupied and anticipate. This usually occurs for most people in adolescence. Um, I know one of the drugs that I was preoccupied with as an adolescent, um, thank goodness had not become addicted to it, but a buddy of mine who was my best buddy, and of course peer pressure puts pressure on you, got me into drinking alcohol. And thank goodness we didn't do it as a daily thing, but it was an every Saturday night thing. When we would go out, there would always be a bottle of alcohol in the car. So could have I become an alcoholic? Yes, absolutely. I was petrified of it and petrified of an auto accident, but he actually drove safer, hard to believe, when he was a little bit inebriated because we were 17 and he was afraid of being stopped by a police officer. Part of the problem is adolescents are experimenters, so they're going to be preoccupied and they're going to experiment, but then they, if they continue to use, they will settle on a certain drug or drugs, and of course intoxication is the result, and then eventually from being intoxicated, there's going to be consequences that result. 
So then the person wants to get off the drug, and a lot of people will try to withdraw themselves, but of course then there's a negative effect. And of course with the opiates, one of the biggest negative effects are the pain and the unpleasant symptoms that people experience. So if they don't get into treatment because they're having all these physical symptoms, the cycle starts over again where they start using or where they think, well, I can control my use. You know, I can only take two Percocet a day instead of 20. But before long, they're right back to that intoxicated state and the cycle repeats itself. So since the focus of our grant work here and this webinar is on opioids, I'm going to talk about those drugs, but I'm also going to talk a little bit about alcohol because alcohol is a very dangerous substance and because oftentimes people will use more than one substance. Or we may get people off of opioid addiction, but then they start abusing alcohol. And some of the relapse prevention medications are the same for both disorders. So that's why I brought in a little bit about alcohol. Morphine is a wonderful medication. I've been a nurse for, um, for quite a number of years now, and when I was a young nurse and a new nurse working med surge, of course the, the primary pain med of choice back then was Demerol, and we've learned that Demerol really is not the best pain med. Morphine is an excellent medication for pain, and it's probably one of the more widely used medications today in hospitals. Now, there's a question posed here. What is the street drug of abuse that's related to morphine? And that would be heroin, and of course opium and methadone are other forms of opioids. And what happens outside are the behavioral effects of heroin use, which include first a rush, and then the person abusing the heroin will feel euphoric. They will have reduced anxiety. They may have some nausea and drowsiness. And then, of course, with the opioid medications, there are the acute withdrawal symptoms where they will have intense muscle aches and pain. Uh, many patients describe it kind of like an influenza syndrome, you know, when you get that kind of bone pain where your body just aches all over. Piloerection, which is goosebumps. Um, some patients may become slightly febrile. I'll be honest, I really don't see much of that. Some patients will have diarrhea. Some also will be constipated initially, but then when they withdraw, the diarrhea starts. They'll be irritable, and they'll have increased lacrimation. In other words, they will have tearing eyes, a runny nose, rhinorrhea. Um, and, and these are kind of like these classic withdrawal symptoms. Now, heroin is primarily snorted or used intravenously. And of course, deaths can result from respiratory arrest. Now, I want to share a little story with you. We had a few years ago um, several deaths in addicts from heroin that had been laced with fentanyl. And um, heroin potency is really going to be dependent upon what geographic area you live in. Uh, living in southern New Jersey and working in Philadelphia, uh, so the South Jersey, Philadelphia region, um, usually the heroin is rather potent heroin. And what was happening was that some, um, you know, the drug dealers were lacing the heroin with fentanyl, which made the heroin that much more potent. So we're talking individuals who could abuse up to like three bundles of heroin um, a day, which is 36 bags of heroin, or 39 bags of heroin rather, there's 13 bags in a bundle, and um, they would use one of these bags laced with the fentanyl and they would die of respiratory arrest. In fact, there were around nine deaths within a sh very short time. What was interesting, if you picked up the Camden Courier, one of the newspapers where they had interviewed a heroin addict, this addict said that he would love to get his hand on one of those bags because even though it could kill him, that must be the ultimate euphoria. That is an addiction problem. Now what's happening inside, let's go back to our sending neuron and then our dendrites on the receiving neuron. 
and you have the nerve impulse, you have the neurotransmitters binding to that dendrite of the receiving neuron. And of course, let's bring in some heroin that's going to, of course, also bind and enhance the effect. And when we activate those opioid receptors, we get that increased transmission or that rush. So when we look at the narcotic class of medication, the opioids, they really are derived from the opium through the poppy plant. You know, Afghanistan is one of the largest uh, producers of that. We use them in the form of prescriptions for pain control. Um, and of course, they have become drugs of significant abuse, um, certainly available off the street today. They block pain. They produce euphoria. They are highly addictive substances, and they can be found in just about every form. But the two primary forms of abuse are to use nasal insufflation, which is snorting the drug, or to inject it. ER visits have dramatically increased um, because of use of opioid medications. And these are some of the common ones that are abused. Um, again, heroin being a Schedule I drug, there is no medical indication for the use of heroin. But certainly, the other drugs that are listed, people use in the form of either prescriptions or they get them off the street. And heroin will affect a larger area of the brain in the VTA than what morphine will. Morphine tends to have many more specific receptor sites than heroin does. And you can see here are opioid receptors and morphine coming in to bind to those receptor sites. So if dependence develops with the opioids, drug procurement then dominates the individual's life. And then, of course, as the person develops tolerance and they need to use more and more of the drug, oftentimes it will lead to criminal behavior. Um, we've had addicts that I've cared for who you know, have robbed CVS pharmacies to get money to buy heroin or other opioids off the street. Now, heroin, which is diacetylmorphine, is more lipid soluble than morphine. Any time a drug crosses the blood-brain barrier, it has to be very lipophilic and the molecules have to be small. So heroin is actually more lipid soluble than morphine and therefore it crosses the blood-brain barrier more easily, which I think then what you could deduce is that the person abusing it is going to have more of an intense euphoria with an end result of sedation. It is also more quickly metabolized compared to other opiates. It's excreted in the urine as free or conjugated morphine, and the end result is euphoria, sedation, and analgesia. And again, we said that overdoses primarily can cause respiratory depression or arrest. That's usually what the patient would succumb to. Um, of course, the patient, when they reach that state, would be bradycardic, hypothermia, and then, of course, would die. Again, we talked about the two methods of use, primarily being intravenous or nasal insufflation. And we also talked, I gave you an example, about how overdoses result from the variability in the potency of the heroin that's purchased on the street. Um, how they have rapid loss of tolerance after a period of abstinence. So again, then if they pick up again, if they take too large a dose, that also could cause respiratory depression. And of course, there are the many other physical complications that can result. We're not even talking about HIV infection or hepatitis C from sharing IV needles or from how the heroin is eventually shot up with cotton fibers in, 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 in getting it ready. Um, people are very prone to bacterial septicemias and endocarditis, again, from using contaminated needles. The withdrawal symptoms will start dependent on the type of opioid, anywhere from 2 to 48 hours of last use. With heroin, there is a more abrupt withdrawal, as heroin has a shorter half-life than many of the other opioids. So the symptoms tend to be more prompt and more severe. 
And the classic withdrawal symptoms from the opioids I described in the other slide, restlessness, again, lacrimation, rhinorrhea, nausea. They're going to initially, when they're using the drug, have um, pinpoint pupils, and then, of course, they'll dilate as the drug wears off, muscle aches, and diarrhea. Piloerection. Some patients get tachycardic and hypertensive, but again, I don't see it as much in heroin addicts as I do in other forms of addiction. So how do we manage the patient? And that's what we want to get to is the pharmacology. But teaching pharmacology for ANCC, I always tie it to some clinical syndrome because to me pharmacology, without understanding the pathophysiology of the clinical syndrome makes no sense. I, I have to be one that puts it all together. At least that's how I learn. So there are a variety of ways in which you can manage opioid dependency. One of the hallmarks of our treatment center, and I totally agree with this, we believe in keeping the patient comfortable through the withdrawal phase. If the patient is experiencing intense withdrawal symptoms and we're not appropriately medicating the patient, they will tend to leave treatment to go out and abuse heroin again because the craving will be so intense. So one of the things for the first three to five days generally is to try to keep them comfortable through use of medication to control their symptoms. And there's a variety of medications that can be used. Um, one medication that works very well is clonidine, which is catapress, although you may know it as a medication to lower blood pressure. Catapress works on the central nervous system and it does reduce the effect of pain. Now, of course, when clonidine catapress is used, we have holding parameters for that medication. If the patient's systolic blood pressure is less than 100, and I also use a pulse rate less than 60, we hold the dose of catapress. We also believe in round-the-clock medication with a gradual reduction each day as opposed to just medicating symptoms. You want to try to maintain a peak blood level so that the patient is pain-free. I've seen phenobarbital used because that will sedate them, not so much pain med, but also has a sedative effect. So some people and treatment centers will use a combination of phenobarbital and clonidine. Um, Librium, which is a benzodiazepine, can also be used. Now, the newer treatment in most centers today for opioid dependency is the use of Suboxone or Subutex. Subutex is buprenorphine, which is a Schedule III opioid agonist. It's a partial opioid agonist. Suboxone has naloxone in it, which is Narcan. So Suboxone is a partial opioid agonist, but it's also a partial antagonist. And the theory is if you're blocking the opioid receptor sites, you know, why you're giving the agonist effect through the suboxone, the patient will not want to use, um, use opioid medication to prescribe Suboxone or Subutex for detoxification. To range, um, patients really have to be um, induced and it should be based on how symptomatic they are. Um, so they should be in the office setting for quite a while through the induction phase. Um, an average dose would be anywhere, a small dose would be two milligrams anywhere up to around 18 milligrams or so, and some people will be on a split dose. When they first came out, it was in a sublingual tab. Now it is a suboxone or a subutex film, which is a melt-away. And again, patients can be given a one-month prescription, and then they come back for reevaluation. When these medications first came out, it was felt that short-term treatment would be their use, but today we know that Longer-term treatment keeps people in recovery longer. So it's not unusual to see people on these medications for a year, two years, three years. Eventual goal to gradually wean the dosing down so that they would be off the medication. 
the patient has nausea or vomiting, and we're going to use antiemetics. One example would be Tigan. We use Levsin at times, which is for abdominal cramping. It's a sublingual tablet that can be given every um, six hours. And then we also use muscle relaxers for the acute muscle pain. So the protocol that our medical director has developed, we have Suboxone, usually starting at around 4 milligrams, and it's written into the protocol signed by the medical director. Um, we also use Librium. We give them a, a loading dose of Librium, and then they're on Librium for a few days. That's, again, just to keep them comfortable. And then we also use Roboxone, usually 1,500 milligrams three times a day. Roboxone is not sedating. It's a muscle relaxer. And it was really one of our nurse practitioners in our practice who said, could we try 10 milligrams of Flexerol at bedtime? Because Flexerol has a little bit of sedation to it. And what we noticed when we added the Robaxin and Flexerol into the protocol, these patients were not seeking medication for pain or anything. Now, the Robaxin and Flexerol are only in the protocol for around five days. It's not something we use continuously because, of course, the goal is to get them off the medication. So in our orders for Suboxone, Subutex, and these medications, it's a wean down over that five-day period until they're off the medication. And we've had a fairly good success rate uh, with getting patients detoxified um, from opiates using a protocol like that. Now, they are going to need counseling, psychotherapy. Our program is rooted in the 12-step philosophy of AA and NA. And also many um, addiction centers are also exploring other types of alternative therapies like hypnosis. For relapse prevention, well, relapse prevention, we use it for detox, and also relapse prevention is maintaining the patient on Suboxone. Um, the other drug that can be used if the patient does not want to be on Suboxone, or especially if they have not been opioid dependent for over a year, we could use now Trexone, the brand name being Rivia. Now Trexone blocks the opioid receptors. Uh, the dosing, we start at 25 milligrams at bedtime, once daily for three days, then bump it up to 50 milligrams thereafter. When you start now Trexone, the patient needs to be opioid naive, meaning that they have not had an opiate and we use a rule of 10 days. Some centers will use five days, some use seven days. But if the patient, for example, say is on Percocet for pain, and we kick in now Trexone, they will go through withdrawal symptoms like you've never seen and like you do not want to see. So we have to make sure that they're opiate naive for that 10-day time period is what our medical director uses. Now, now Trexone is contraindicated if the patient has hepatitis or any severe liver disease or elevated liver enzymes. So you really need to screen patients with LFTs prior to prescribing that drug. Suboxone and Subutex we talked about. We're going to talk a little bit about methadone as a relapse prevention drug. Um, just a little bit more on Suboxone. It's a partial opioid receptor agonist antagonist. I told you about the Drug Addiction Treatment Act, DATA 2000. Um, right now, in our country, only physicians are allowed to prescribe Suboxone or Subutex for detox from opioids. This is an issue that INSA has mounted an effort on with colleagues. Um, we feel that certainly advanced practice nurses certified in the field of addictions and practicing there should be able to prescribe this medication for detoxification, and we have to get the legislation uh, change. So this is a policy issue confronting uh, INSA right now. And you can see um, in, in the initial legislation back in 2000s, physicians could only have a maximum of 30 patients in their practice. Um, that was changed to 100 uh, patients in their practice now per provider, per physician provider, maybe about three or four years ago. Again, the Drug Enforcement Agency monitors this, and we cannot yet prescribe this. Suboxone does occupy the opioid receptor sites, blocking the effect of the opioids. There's a lower potential for abuse. It is a much safer uh, drug. The safety profile is much greater in preventing accidental overdose than methadone. 
And um, to initiate therapy, um, again, initially it was uh, sublingually. Now it is a melt-away strip that they call a film. It's once daily dosing or sometimes split dosing. And clients can be maintained in outpatient uh, treatment with this. And it is combined with counseling. You need to know that Suboxone is now the number one prescribed uh, medication. It has exceeded um, the amount of methadone that's used. Butrans is made by the drug company, and it's a buprenorphine transdermal system. that it's administered orally, it's once daily dosing, it's administered at a methadone uh, clinic, um, so patients are, are watched and monitored and of course get the counseling that they need. And it is a long-acting full opioid receptor agonist. It functions at the mu receptor sites in the brain. Uh, these receptor sites exist on the surfaces of our brain cells. And the belief is that activation of the mu receptors are responsible for the analgesic and euphoric effects of opioids. Now, a little bit on methadone kinetics. Um, you can see the half-life is rather long, 24 to 36 hours. It reaches a steady state within about five to seven and a half days. Blood levels are influenced by a variety of things, such as absorption, metabolism, protein binding, the pH of the urine, if they're on other meds, diet, age, physical activity, pregnancy, and vitamins. And the rule in methadone is not to have this protocol, but to dose it according to the individual. And it's much like we treat the elderly with pharmacology, start low and go slow. Um, and that's because optimal doses are going to vary by patient. We use a clinical opioid withdrawal scale which measures objective symptoms of acute withdrawal. And you can see if the score is 0 to 5, they don't get methadone. We don't start them on methadone unless they are in acute withdrawal. And according to the Center for Substance Abuse Treatment, these have to be clients who have been opioid dependent for at least over a year or we don't use methadone. So we want people to have the time to react to the initial dose. We want to avoid over-aggressively uh, dosing because we don't want to create toxicity. And we got to monitor the patient. And just to show you the cumulative effect of methadone, if dose A is 30 milligrams daily for, with no increase for six days, so the patient's going to get 30 milligrams of methadone daily, by day six, it's equivalent to almost 60 milligrams of methadone. If dose B has an initial dose of 30 milligrams on day one, and we increase that dose daily by 10 milligrams every day for another five days, by day six, the cumulative effect of the dosing is 140 milligrams. That's where overdose deaths can occur, and that's why we need to start much slower. Um, we've got to be aware of subtle signs and symptoms of overmedication, patients feeling good. Um, patients may need more time, not necessarily more medication. And of course, the adverse reactions are typically what we see with the opioids, things like constipation, paresthesias, weight gain, decreased libido, and some patients get a rash. And these are the health conditions that can affect dosing. For example, it's really criminal if there's a pregnant woman who's been on methadone therapy when she gets pregnant, she needs to be maintained on methadone therapy. But as the fetus gets bigger, especially around the third trimester, that patient's probably going to be having withdrawal symptoms and the methadone dose is going to need to be increased because the fetus is getting some of that methadone. And I want to point out that there is an FDA black box warning. It's the prolonged QT syndrome in doses greater than 200 milligrams or with IV administration. So the question is, should an EKG be done pre-administration of methadone? Depends who you talk to. Some centers don't do an EKG. Some do an EKG when the dose reaches 100 milligrams. Some when it reaches 200 milligrams. And I recently read in a pain management journal of anesthesia, they are recommending that prior to initiation of methadone, 
therapy that everyone have a pretreatment EKG. The problem is that methadone at higher dose with a prolonged QT syndrome can call torsades de pont, which is a combination of, if you look here, looks like ventricular fibrillation with VTAC. People are unresponsive, apneic and pulseless usually when this happens, um, and they need to be um, shocked, defibrillated or cardioverted, and of course the cause of the etiology needs to be corrected. There are also multiple drug interactions, things like sedatives, antidepressants, some of the HIV meds, the antifungals, um, any of the inducers and inhibitors of your CYP450 enzyme system can have an effect on methadone dosing. So relapse prevention, we've got to try to get to what triggers it. Um, all the relapse meds that we use for opioid prevention, you know, preventing relapse from opioids, um, are not effective, and all the literature shows us that unless the patient has ongoing counseling and therapy, either through 12-step programs or individual and group counseling. Lastly, I just want to comment quickly on alcoholism because it's not an illicit drug. And one of the things that can happen, we see it sometimes in methadone clinics, people will start picking up alcohol, which can be very dangerous if you're on methadone and you're drinking alcohol. So some centers, when the patient presents and they smell alcohol, they will not administer that day's methadone dose because they don't want to cause the patient a respiratory problem. All I want to say about alcoholism is that it does affect all our body systems eventually, of course the liver being the organ that it primarily affects. Uh, primary care providers are critical. We see people, when we do routine blood work and they have elevated liver enzymes, it could be many things, but we need to explore abuse of alcohol as one of them. And we can use a CAGE questionnaire, which is a well-validated tool that works. And the letters stand for something. The C is, have you tried to cut down on your drinking? The A, are you annoyed by people telling you to stop drinking? The G is, do you feel guilty? And the E is an eye-opener, do you drink when you first get up in the morning? Detox, my DMP project a few years ago, I looked at the evidence for all the substances and what was recommended for detox. And with alcohol, what is recommended really are the benzodiazepine class of medications. Um, could be Valium, could be Librium, could be Ativan, could be Cirax, whatever works in your center. Uh, we use Librium in my center, which is the gold standard. Certainly alcoholics, because they're drinking their calories, need vitamin B replacement with thiamine and folate. And we do not put patients on anti-seizure med unless they have an underlying seizure disorder. So not an alcohol withdrawal seizure where they abruptly stopped alcohol and that's why they had a seizure. But if they have an underlying epilepsy and they're not on, you know, they're not on a medication, then our preferred drug is Tegretol. However, you have to watch Tegretol, which is carbamazepine, because if their liver is impaired, the toxic levels can build up quickly, and you'll know it because the patient becomes very quickly disoriented with the staggered gait. So you have to monitor the levels. Our protocol consists of Librium, and then we also kick in Clonidine for a really acute withdrawal, um, where they may, may need a medication to control blood pressure and um, pulse rate. And we will not start the Librium unless their blood alcohol or their breathalyzer um, is below 0 0.100. And we assess patients prior to Librium dosing with what's called the CWOC scale, which is a clinical withdrawal scale for alcoholism. Again, other meds that you can use are Ativan or Cirax, and they also engage in the 12-step meetings. And then quickly, the relapse prevention meds, and this is where you'll see where we can simultaneously use some of these meds for opioid dependency as well. Camprel is one of the drugs. Camprel, which is a camprosate, comes as a 333 milligram tablet. Um, the dosing is 666 milligrams or two tabs of the 333 milligram tablets three times a day. We're not sure of the exact mechanism of action on Camprel. Um, however, it's felt to restore chemical balance in the brain. And the good news is it can be given to patients who 
have liver problems. It's not contraindicated. Now, Trexone also works on alcohol dependency. So again, if I have someone who's opioid and alcohol dependent, this drug will work. But again, because of the alcoholism, I really want to monitor and make sure their liver enzymes are within the normal range. Um, now, if they're not, the manufacturer of Naltrexone came out with Vivacrol. This is an um, injectable, long-acting substance. It's in a very lipid um, solution. And it's a dose of 300 milligrams once monthly. It's given IM into the glute. And if you think about it, it bypasses the effect of the liver because you're injecting it IM rather than ingesting it orally. Um, and if you look at the dose of naltrexone, 50 milligrams once daily for 30 days is 1,500 milligrams of the drug, whereas the dose of Vivotrol, which lasts one injection, lasts for a month, it's only 380 milligrams. So you're about a quarter to a third of the dose of the oral dose. Um, so in alcoholics, we tend to use a combination of naltrexone and camprel or Vivotrol and camprel. Disulfiram, which is an abuse, is recommended as a medication to be used in people who are opioid dependent on methadone and start abusing alcohol. However, an abuse has profound effects if the person has any type of blood alcohol level and it can be lethal. So disulfiram is not a drug that you really see prescribed that much. It can have really bad consequences if you drink on top of using that drug. Again, we need to do counseling and psychotherapy, reiterating even with the alcohol meds, which some can be used simultaneously with opioids, no relapse prevention med can be effective without ongoing counseling and psychotherapy. And these are the references, and uh, what I would like to invite you to explore, um, if you're considering being a member of our organization, we publish a quarterly journal called the Journal of Addictions Nursing, and I publish twice a year, every other quarter, a pharmacology corner article. Um, past issues, we've discussed uh, disulfiram and abuse, we've discussed suboxone, we've discussed Vibitrol, you know, really going into each med in detail. And then every other issue, I also do a health policy issue, and the last health policy issue was on the prescribing of Suboxone and Subutex by APNs. So it's really an excellent journal that's relevant to all of us, no matter where we work, because addiction crosses all practice settings, not just addiction treatment centers. Um, these are some websites that you may want to explore. They had a, have a lot of free information, the National Institute of Health, um, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, and then, of course, under that, is the division called CSAT, which is the Center for Substance Abuse Treatment. So it's been uh, my pleasure to have been with you today. And uh, we did get through all 70 slides. And we will open it for the last few minutes for some questions. So I will um, see if you have any questions. Well, thank you, Dr. Rendia, for an excellent and informative presentation. Um, we do have some questions that have been submitted, so I will go through those um, for you, and we will get through as many as we can with the time that we have left. And any that we don't um, get through, we will have um, submitted back to the group in, in with some written um, answers from, from Dr. Rendio, and we'll provide those with the handouts and the recording of the, of the webinar for all of the participants. Um, so I'm going to go through these as best I can. I do apologize um, if I don't um, pronounce anything correctly, but um, our original moderator was a little bit ill today with, a, with no voice. So I'm filling in, and I will do my best. <laughs> okay. Um, Okay, so one question is, which medication is currently used, um, being used across the nation with the most success, and how do we address the fact that once many patients leave the acute care setting, they cannot afford their medication, quickly um, leading to a quick, quick relapse? Well, that's an excellent question, and I, I think what you um, want to do, the most used medication for the opioids, especially for relapse prevention, is Suboxone. 
That is the most prescribed drug right now for relapse prevention of opioids. Um, I think you need to make sure the patient is set up with referrals. Um, it could be clinics. Some places have clinics. It could be a lot of physicians will prescribe this um, independently, have independent practices. Um, when the drug initially came out, you had to pay cash for it. Now many insurance companies are also funding that uh, medication. So it's going to be dependent on the uh, patient's insurance. One of the things that I think we need to look at, uh, probably in acute care setting, is trying to get some social workers who have an addictions background, someone like an LCADC, a licensed clinical alcohol and drug counselor, who would know the referral sources and where to send people to. Great. Um, okay, here's another one. Um, can you discuss the safety of using um, Subutex versus methadone for maintenance in opiate-addicted pregnant patients? Um, there's new research on that. Um, pregnancy is really not my forte per se because in our treatment center um, we will not accept someone who is pregnant, uh, primarily because of liability reasons and it's not our area of expertise. But there's been some research going on and buprenorphine tends to be working as well as um, methadone. And so you're seeing clinicians who do treat pregnancy uh, and the patient's opioid dependent using buprenorphine. And again, the buprenorphine has a much better safety um, profile than methadone. Great. I think we have time for another, another question here. Um, let's see. Some, pa um, some patients are maintained on Subutex versus um, Suboxone. Subutex provides more of the pleasure seeking, is this true or not true, is one more studied than the other? Well, there, the only difference between the two, I mean, Suboxone is Subutex, but it's got the Naloxone in it to block the opioid receptors. So yes, if you're on uh, Suboxone, by blocking the opioid receptors, there's no sense in using um, opioids because you're, you're not going to get that effect. Whereas Subutex would be the partial opioid agonist, so yeah, you're hitting the receptors to get some of the pleasure from that, but certainly if you continue to use heroin, you're also going to hit those receptor sites. And that's why what I see prescribed most frequently is the Suboxone because you actually want to block those receptor sites. Now, I should mention that Vivitrol initially came out, that's the naltrexone that's injectable um, for alcoholism, but about a year and a half ago it was also approved for opioid dependency because, again, that blocks the opioid receptors. Uh, one of the verdicts that's not out, um, if an opioid addict really wants to use, because they're not, if they're not getting the Suboxone um, effect or the Subutex with it, would that lead to more overdose because they would have to take significant amount of opioids to override those receptors that are blocked. Great. Why don't we do one more and then we'll um, answer the rest of these that have been submitted um, um, in written responses. Um, what did your research show about the use of um, phenobarbitrol and the use of alcohol detoxification? Phenobarbital is a wonderful drug. I mean, the literature really points to the benzos, phenobarbs more in a barbiturate class, but it's a wonderful drug. And my experience with it was when we had a medical director who had become ill. He actually had cancer, and another medical director came in for around nine months. And he used phenobarbital for every substance use disorder, for benzodiazepine dependency, alcohol dependency, um, opioid dependency, and it worked. And I was shocked because I really believed in Librium for alcoholism, and I've seen it work. And I've seen it, he felt it was a very safe drug, even in higher dose. He used much higher dosing than I was used to. We never had a patient problem. I personally still feel the benzos work better for alcoholism than phenobarb. 
Phenobarbital is actually my preferred drug for benzodiazepine dependency. It works very well. So phenobarb is a very good drug, and of course you're getting the anti-seizure activity with that medication as well. Great. Well, thank you very much for answering those questions, and we do have a few more that came in, so we will submit those, like I said, um, in writing and provide those to all the attendees along with the handouts and the recorded um, webinar. So um, at this time, we really just want to thank you all for um, attending. Um, we will also have all attendees will receive an email shortly from the American Academy of Addiction Psychiatry that um, includes the link for the evaluation um, survey. So please take a few minutes to access that and provide your feedback on today's session. You'll also get your certificate of, um, certificate of attendance at that time. So um, that will be helpful for you um, should you need that. The webinar, um, as I mentioned, was recorded and will be posted on our website as well as the um, PCSSO website, um, which is pcss-o.org, um, as well as the calendar of upcoming events um, and cl helpful clinical resources are available there as well. Our next webinar will be in early May um, with um, uh, Peggy Compton discussing treat um, treating chronic pain with um, prescription opioids in the person with substance abuse disorders, relapse prevention and management. So um, we'll be posting registration for that shortly. Um, but we hope you will join us um, for all of our upcoming webinars, and we thank you again for your attendance.